China's commercial AI ecosystem in many ways is, is a global leader. Um, and China's military has undertaken a really incredible series of reforms you know, over the past 10, 15 years or so um, that have made them stronger and better in a lot of different ways. So if the Department of Defense fails to reform, it is totally possible that we would lose our, our military technology edge. China and AI, a U.S. Department of Defense perspective. To discuss, we have on Greg Allen, a new CSIS fellow. He recently left the department where he was working as the Director of Strategy and Policy at the DOD's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Co-hosting with me today on another edition of China Acquisition Talk is Eric Lofgren. Greg, welcome to China Talk. Um, one minute, what is the Jake? Hey, thanks very much for having me on the podcast. I think the best way to understand the Jake is that it is the organization that the Department of Defense set up uh, back in 2018 uh, to accelerate the adoption of artificial intelligence into all aspects of the DOD. And one thing that's a little bit unusual in terms of the organizational construct is that they had folks who were actually building the technologies working alongside folks who were helping steer policy and strategy for the entire department. And that was the role that I had as the director of strategy and policy. Gotcha. We will come back to that uh, sort of uh, fascinating bureaucratic history. But first, let's talk about headlines. Um, what is the role of commercial technology and AI technology in particular um, when it's um, when applied to the most recent case of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine? Sure. I think to start here, it helps to have a little bit of historical context, which is that as commercial technology has been getting more and more impressive over the past three decades, the defense industrial base, the types of companies who make weapons for the U.S. Department of Defense have actually getting, been getting more and more isolated from that part of the economy. So way back in 1991, defense specialists, companies whose primary customer is the DOD, got about 10 percent market share in what the Defense Department spends its money on. And these days, that's closer to 60%. So these companies are primarily and almost exclusively focused upon the Department of Defense. That is a story where military technology was increasingly divorced in many ways from commercial technology. And commercial technology was seen of sort of secondary relevance to military priorities. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has sort of flipped that on its head. Because across AI, drones, cyber, and space technology, these are all areas where commercial technology capabilities have been dramatically and immediately relevant for military-type performance. Um, so a few areas where that's pretty interesting. Uh, the Ukrainian side, which we know more about for obvious reasons, right, because the Ukrainians are bragging about all of their successes with AIs and the Russians are not ra loudly proclaiming their failures on the same thing. So the first thing to understand is there's a bit of an information asymmetry here, which is make, gives us an, an imperfect understanding of what's happening in the conflict. But from what we know, we can see that there's a few instances where AI is already making a pretty big difference. Uh, to begin, commercial satellite imagery. Uh, there's a lot of space companies up there who are taking a lot of pictures, both in the visual light spectrum, but also in other areas like synthetic aperture radar. These are capabilities that used to be reserved to nation states, and now there are a lot of companies who are performing these types of activities. And part of the reason why these companies are able to pull it off is because they don't have to hire, you know, the armies of imagery analysts that the U.S. government has used to perform this mission over decades. They can rely on artificial intelligence to share a lot of that workload burden. So the photos that you're seeing, you know, on the front page of the New York Times or other news sources are coming from these commercial satellite companies who where AI is a huge part of their business model. Another area where AI is making a difference is also in the intelligence side of the equation. So Russians, uh, the Russian military has in many cases been communicating over unencrypted channels because they've done a pretty lousy job of setting up their communication networks for this uh, invasion. So that means there's a lot of Russian radio signals going out with Russian language being spoken on those signals. So Ukraine does not have, you know, an infinitely large army of folks to uh, capture all of those signals, transcribe all of those signals and throw them into some kind of database. But as anybody who's been using Siri or Alexa for a long time knows, 
AI is pretty good at voice recognition these days. And so one commercial company, you know, Primer, has been working with the Ukrainian government to intercept a ton of this Russian military radio traffic, automatically transcribe it, so convert the audio to text using machine learning, and then make that into a searchable database uh, where you can actually flag things and get the right information to the right folks at the right time. Um, and that kind of uh, capability, again, is something that you know large intelligence agencies have had for a long time, but what uh, commercial AI has done has, you know, lowered the barriers to entry and increased the performance at decreasing cost uh, for these types of capabilities. Well, I guess just a quick follow up on that. Are these commercial capabilities better than what the DOD has or are they, uh, you know, still some some ways to go? Uh, it depends on which uh, topic you're going at. You know, when it comes to spy satellites, uh, the United States government has stuff that is considerably more advanced, right, than is what in, in the commercial market. And sometimes that's just a matter of law. Uh, you know, the the major companies who do the most advanced satellite imagery are not allowed to sell imagery uh, beyond a certain precision, uh, or at least not allowed, allowed to export imagery beyond a certain precision. Um, but in other areas, it's just because the DOD has been doing this for a long time. Uh, but when it comes to AI, it, the, the sort of general purpose technologies uh, the sort of backbone of AI capabilities, there's plenty of areas in which the commercial industry is ahead of the Department of Defense. So coming to the question of like lessons for the PLA, looking at this uh, conflict from an AI perspective, what do you think is uh, is kind of being downloaded and downloaded into their brain? Sure. So I, I think the the first aspect of this is the role that this is going to play in the Russian economy. Um, so the first package of sanctions that the United States Department of Treasury announced uh, in response to Russia's invasion, literally like the first thing they mentioned was cutting Russia off from semiconductors technology. Uh, and semiconductors, as we all know, are foundational to a bunch of different parts of the economy, uh, but they're especially important in training and using advanced AI capabilities. You know, if you want to use fancy machine learning uh, in your military systems, you know, chips from the 1970s, 80s, you know, early 2000s are just not going to cut it. It's a field that really does demand uh, bleeding edge performance in a lot of cases. And so the Russian industry, you know, does not have a credible path to reconstituting their own domestic semiconductor manufacturing capability that is at a peer level uh, with that of the United States or the global semiconductor industry. So instead of coming up with an amazing domestic industrial base, the challenge that they are going to attempt to overcome is how to build up an amazing smuggling operation. And China is a critical part of what Russians are going to be attempting in terms of evading sanctions on semiconductors and other AI enabling uh, technologies. So the part of the government that's responsible for export controls is a chunk of the Department of Commerce uh, known, of, known as the Bureau of Industry and Security. And in very large part as a result of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the budget request for that agency has jumped from $133 million to nearly $200 million. And that is because they have the most ambitious to-do list ahead of them uh, since the end of the Cold War. And so much of what they're responsible for stopping uh, is what Russia is going to try and run through China. 2027 and 2030, what do these dates mean for the PLA and AI? So I think the, the really important date is 2030. So back in uh, 2017, uh, the Chinese government put out what they called their next generation AI plan. And this is very colloquially referred to as China's national AI strategy. Um, and it set all kinds of goals for various aspects of China's uh, economy, their government, their military, in terms of taking advantage of the potential that AI has to offer. Um, and they set a series of you know, milestones for when, when, when they wanted to match uh, world state-of-the-art and when they wanted to actually lead uh, the world state-of-the-art and when they wanted to dominate uh, you know, the global AI industry. And 2030 is the time frame that they set in place for that final marker uh, in terms of dominating uh, the global AI industry. I would say, you know, it's been five years since they put out that strategy, and they have essentially achieved their first five-year goal, which was reaching and matching 
uh, the state of the art. There is a bunch of different ways that you can measure uh, success in this area. Um, all the metrics are imperfect in some way or another, but one that I think is useful and illustrative is the share of the most highly cited papers in AI research. So these are the papers that leading AI scholars are building upon in their own work for the next round uh, of, of work. Um, the share that China occupies in the global AI research ecosystem has just gone on up and up and up and up over the years. And they are on track you know, either this year or next year, if current trends uh, continue to actually be the, the number one publisher of some of these most highly cited AI research papers around the world. You know, I recall going to, you know, Beijing in uh, 2011, back when the sort of cliche was that China cannot innovate, they can only copy. Um, and I remember seeing like the sort of counterfeit electronics, uh, you know, supermarkets uh, in, in China. But those days are, are very much in the rear view mirror in terms of the overall story of, of what's happening in China's technology ecosystem. There are a lot of companies who are generating a lot of revenue and are building really impressive stuff. And there's a lot of universities who are putting out a, a lot of impressive research in AI. So when you think about, you, you kind of alluded to this, but the idea of like measuring who's winning and losing in AI, is this a useful concept? And if it is, like, what are your you know, top five indicators or what, what have you. So I don't know that it's, it's right to say uh, there is a, there's a really solid measure of who's winning and who's losing, but I think it is clearly the case, right? That China is making significant progress um, and not all of that progress is zero sum. Uh, so there's a paper, for instance, from Tsinghua University that found that of the papers that are most highly cited that include Chinese researchers, something like half of those include co-authors from outside of China. Um, so research is an area in which, uh, especially in the AI sector, there's a great deal of international collaboration and the United States benefits significantly uh, from uh, research collaboration with China. The thing that becomes frustrating from a national security perspective and a foreign policy perspective is that some of the organizations who do genuinely state-of-the-art AI research in China are also uh, deeply involved in some things that the, our you know, U.S. foreign policy strongly opposes. Um, this includes the domestic security and repression system being set up in Xinjiang, where AI plays a significant part in the surveillance state uh, over there. Uh, and also in actual genuine military capabilities. Um, there are Chinese you know, tech companies who the United States will experience as sort of purely innocuous commercial business stuff, but actually have reasonably deep ties to the People's Liberation Army um, and are suppliers to there. And so the fact that AI is you know, not just a dual use technology, but a general purpose technology that is weaving itself into all parts of the economy, society, and military um, makes it a real challenge when thinking about what is the right balance of you know, cooperation versus prioritizing security. Yeah, the, uh, the general, you know, you said that it's a generalizable technology, but it also feels like you know, there's these two concepts, right? Like general AI and then kind of more narrow AI. And I guess, you know, how much does their mass of data in China relative to the security state, relative to, you know, mobile consumerism, does that actually translate to like the military side or how generalizable are some of those things relative in China? Or is it just like really who can actually like apply this in these narrow little areas the most, the fastest? Like, does having all this research really benefit them? Or is it really, how do we get that research into technology, into the real world? Absolutely. So, so you raised the point, right, about where, what is the connection between research and actual ability to commercialize or the ability to militarize um, the technology. I'll point out first that when it comes to commercializing, uh, China is quite successful here too, right? There's a number of uh, Chinese startups or large Chinese tech conglomerates that uh, are actually building very successful products, both uh, domestically and abroad. TikTok, for example, 
right? A lot of the secret sauce of TikTok is in the recommendation algorithm that uh, determines what to show folks next so that they you know, continue staying on the platform and engaging with the platform. Um, and that's an area right, where China has been tremendously successful. Um, your point, though, is absolutely right. Um, in general, um, there are certain types of AI technologies like the neural networks algorithm that are highly generalizable and are openly available to anyone uh, on the internet, right? And you can take advantage of that sort of general purpose uh, types of technologies. Similarly, like NVIDIA GPUs, which many uh, companies and research organizations use to train their neural networks uh, from a, a processing power standpoint, um, those are very widely available. Although, as I mentioned, right, we try and cut them off. We try and cut off access of those to uh, Russia as, as a whole, and we try to cut off access of that to military end users um, in China. But there are certain aspects of the artificial intelligence sort of technology stack um, that are not perfectly uh, generalizable. You know, folks have pointed out that data is the new oil and that China seems to have most of uh, the largest data sets. Um, there's parts of that story that are true, but, you know, oil you can turn into gasoline you can turn into a lot of other things if you have a massive amount of you know chinese facial recognition data well that doesn't necessarily help you build a missile guidance system right because you need missile guidance data in order to train uh, a machine learning algorithm for that kind of things so there's plenty of aspects of the advantage in data that are application specific what I do want to point out here, though, is that the overall strength of the Chinese AI ecosystem does have a really strong, uh, does have a strong impact in the Chinese military's ability to, to harness that ecosystem, right? The success of Chinese spatial recognition AI or social media AI or financial data AI that kind of determines how many universities are going to be pumping out how many uh, graduates with these types of skill sets. That determines the size of the workforce, the familiarity with these types of underlying concepts. Um, and so while the data sets might not be fungible, the size of those data sets also sort of uh, translates into the size of an overall ecosystem that the Chinese government has worked very hard to take advantage of. Uh, the Chinese policy of military civil fusion is one that very deliberately seeks to uh, take advantage of what chi of China's success in the commercial technology sector and, and find ways for the People's Liberation Army to make use of that. This idea of different sort of Chinese bureaucracies processing what AI and machine learning is going to do differently. Can you, you know, give us a little bit of a breakdown of uh, weapons manufacturers versus the PLA versus uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and and track two dialogues. How how are all of the how are all these ideas being filtered differently through those organizations or groups? Yeah, so I think um, you know this is a podcast where I can trust the audience understands that China is not a monolith, um, and the fact that China's is not a monolith and China's government is not a monolith sort of plays out in unique ways in terms of what they're up to when it comes to military harnessing of artificial intelligence. Um, so starting with the, the diplomatic part of the story and the, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, there have been negotiations at the United Nations in Geneva uh, on regulating uh, in some way uh, the use of autonomy in weapons systems. Uh, so lethal autonomous weapons is the, the term of art that is most commonly used in international discourse. And back in April 2018, I believe it was, uh, you know, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs put out a paper that said that the, the Chinese government would support a ban on the use of AI-enabled autonomous weapons, but would not support a ban on the development of, of AI-enabled lethal autonomous weapons. Um, so the challenge in all of this, right, is that you have folks who are uh, keeping track of these dialogues who are not AI experts or not national security experts, or perhaps even not an expert on both. So the headlines that went out, you know, around the world were China supports ban on lethal autonomous weapons. And there's a bunch of very important asterisks there that relate to what we were talking about in terms of the complicated, uh, you know, Chinese foreign policy org chart. 
Um, so the first is that, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, is part of the Chinese government, um, whereas the, you know, the People's Liberation Army is the military of the Communist Party. Now, obviously, both of them report up through, you know, Xi Jinping, uh, but the, the story there is a little bit more complicated. You know, in the United States, when uh, the Secretary of State says something on a defense issue uh, around the world, People, people basically understand, right, that the Secretary of State is authorized to speak on behalf of the United States as a whole. Uh, the same is true of the, the Russian foreign minister. Um, but in the case of, of China, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs does not always speak uh, for the People's Liberation Army. And so actually the People's Liberation Army has said relatively little uh, in terms of what it would be interested in or what it would put, put up with. Uh, in terms of diplomacy related artificial intelligence, whether that's coming up with some kind of international norms around what types of technologies are allowed to be used and what types of contexts. Um, in general, you know, it's been radio silent for the PLA. And the weapons manufacturers, some of which are state owned enterprises, some of the largest ones, um, have been incredibly bullish on the use of AI in weapon systems and the use of autonomy in weapon systems. So there's no formal international definition for what an autonomous weapon is, uh, but there is an official DOD definition of this, which is the ability to select and engage targets without further human intervention. So once the human says, hey, I'm putting you in autonomous mode, then the thing can go, uh, you know, find its own targets and engage and perhaps even kill them, right, without further human intervention. That's what we in the DOD define an autonomous weapon as. Well, there's plenty of Chinese weapons manufacturers who are, you know, in their marketing documents, uh, describing capabilities that are consistent with that definition. Um, some of which are even being, you know, we have records of them being exported internationally. So, for example, the Xinyan uh, Blowfish A2 is, is one weapon system that falls into this category. Um, so this, is, this makes it, you know, really hard uh, for a diplomat or somebody, you know, such as myself in the DOD um, to really understand in, in which cases uh, is, you know, one part of the Chinese state not talking to the other. Uh, and it also, you know, makes it a little bit confusing for uh, folks in the United States, whether that's in think tanks or academia or the technology industry, to kind of understand what's going on with China. Because when you see a headline that says, you know, China supports a ban um, on AI-enabled autonomous weapons, you, you know, think, oh, that's perhaps a, a favorable development for world peace. But the unfortunate reality is that a lot of the actions are not backing up, you know, that type of posture. And how about the two track dialogue? Where are they saying? Yeah. So, you know, these these uh, conversations um, are not meant to be, you know, made public. They're they're meant to be uh, confidential. But one aspect of the, the track two dialogues, um, which uh, for those who are not familiar, a track two dialogue, is, a track one dialogue is when our government talks to their government. Uh, the track two dialogue is when our academics or perhaps retired government officials talk to their academics or their retired government officials. Um, and this is a this is a sort of series of formal and informal dialogues uh, that were very helpful during various phases of the Cold War. And that you know tradition has sort of been continued and kept up uh, in the case of China. One thing that makes it you know a little complicated in this case with China is that a lot of their universities who are authorized to speak publicly on security issues have active military affiliations. So you might get, you know, um, somebody who is presenting themselves as participating in a track two dialogue, you know, who is a general in the People's Liberation Army, which makes it seem a lot more like a, you know, a sort of a track 1.5 um, uh, dialogue. But those, those types of institutions and those types of dialogues I'm still in favor of, of them continuing. It's, it's a tool, um, but it's important you know, not to assume that just because somebody in a track two dialogue said something that we can infer that the, you know, the Chinese government or the Chinese military uh, actually agrees with that sentiment. The overarching sentiment out of track two is more like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or more like the weapons manufacturers? Oh, I would say uh, pretty clearly it's it's more like the the Ministry of Foreign Affairs dialogue. But you know, when I was in the Department of Defense, um, 
you know, we raised the issue of, of having a dialogue with China on risk reduction in the case of military AI, um, and the the Chinese always refused that overture. Um, so there has not been that type of diplomatic dialogue outside of the process that takes place, you know, in the United Nations, where again it's the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And is this is this dangerous? So I think there's there's an element of it that that is. Um, so the reason why everyone is so interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning technology fundamentally comes down to the fact that it delivers improved performance at reduced cost. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with machine learning that would not be possible with traditional software. Just for example, you know, a lot of folks had spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to crack facial recognition using sort of traditional computing and software techniques. Um, but once we figured out how to apply machine learning to the problem and especially the subfield of uh, neural networks, um, the performance of facial recognition systems really went through the roof. And so it is that improved performance that has everybody so excited and, and chasing the opportunities of AI. But alongside that improved performance uh, comes new failure modes. Uh, machine learning software breaks, and sometimes it breaks in really strange ways that organizations don't have a great deal of muscle memory preventing. Uh, because it's relatively new and the number of folks who have this expertise is is obviously limited. So in general, you know, the Department of Defense, the United States Department of Defense is in favor of our stuff always working and in favor of, you know, other militaries who are not our allies, their stuff not working. Um, that's how we, t you know, tend to, to, to think about this. There's a very important exception, though, right? And that is uh, when certain types of technical failures might lead to unintentional escalation or unintentional hostile engagements. Um, there's some pretty, you know, uh, scary stories from the Cold War about certain types of technical failures, um, you know, leading to folks thinking that they were under attack when they were not under attack. Uh, and obviously, in a nuclear scenario, that can be incredibly scary. So the Department of Defense, you know, has spent a lot of time thinking about how to reduce uh, these types of accidents, including in machine learning, you know, and we've gotten really good at it. And, and one of the things that we want to have, a, we, we have wanted to have a conversation on is, is there some kind of, uh, you know, norms we should be considering or uh, other types of just conversation around uh, how do we mutually uh, take advantage of our shared incentive to reduce the risks uh, of these types of things. Um, that's that's where I that's what I think about in, in terms of risks that are worth paying attention to. We're kind of getting towards responsible AI, right? And there's a big debate on this. So, what are those issues that people are actually debating? You know, in the Department of Defense when they're writing these policies, are there unsettled things, controversial things, or are people pretty aligned on what responsible AI actually is? Sure. Um, so I was actually in the seat at, at the Jake uh, when the Department of Defense adopted its ethical principles for artificial intelligence, you know, back in February 2020. Um, the current administration reaffirmed those ethical principles and, you know, also announced some measures to try and implement that uh, throughout the Department of Defense. Um, I think there's a few aspects of this issue uh, that I would I would point to as, as interesting. Um, the first is, you know, the principles for ethics in warfare um, are pretty old, right? Like the original, you know, Geneva Convention is over a hundred years old, and established principles um, that have been built upon, you know, over time in international law, uh, such as you know, what, what it means to, to ethically use force uh, in, in wartime. These are principles like military necessity, you know, don't attack things that you don't have a legitimate military purpose for, or proportionality, you know, if they throw a rock at you, don't respond with a nuke, um, or distinction, right? Did you actually take uh, enough appropriate measures to make sure that you were attacking military forces and not civilian forces? Those are the types of principles that establish what it means to ethically use force. And as I said, they're really quite old and they're really quite good, frankly. Um, what is a little bit new in terms of artificial intelligence is, as I said, right, 
there are there's a great opportunity for more performance in these systems. And one aspect of that is as these systems become more capable, uh, the types of functions that you would allow them to perform becomes more diverse, broader, longer lasting, more autonomous just in, in general. Um, and so what I think about uh, most notably in terms of, of responsible use of AI is, okay, we have these principles around you know, what it means to be um, ethical when it comes to the use of force. And we also have uh, a lot of machinery and process around that. There, you know, one out of every 300 employees at the Department of Defense is a lawyer. Uh, which I think is a pretty remarkable statistic and one that I don't think you know any other uh, military around the world can do it. But that's because we take our commitment to the law of war so seriously. There's a lot of institutional competence around ensuring that we do that. So how do we carry that forward into an era in which we're increasingly taking advantage of artificial intelligence technology? As I mentioned, right, machine learning technology has incredible performance, but it also has new and different and sometimes strange, frankly, failure modes. So how do we ensure that in an organization as large as the DOD, it's got 3 million employees, it's got a budget of over $750 billion. So there's a lot going on in the Department of Defense. How do we know and show that we're going to abide uh, by those ethical commitments? And that includes both the ethical commitments around the law of armed conflict, the old ones, as well as these new uh, AI ethics principles that the DOD put out in February 2020. And that's stuff like responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, and governable. Those were the principles that the DOD put out in 2020. And I think those principles are definitely ethical in nature, um, but they're really about that knowing and showing how do you implement. And so a lot of what we spent after those principles came out um, was thinking about what were the process refinements that the Department of Defense needed to put in place uh, in order to live up to those commitments. And I think the strategy and implementation of those principles uh, is one of the, the, the tougher questions that we've had to wrestle with um, and an area that we spent a lot of attention, including at the most senior levels of the DOD. Well, it seems like, you know, just thinking about those principles, are they actionable? Right. Like kind of governable. You know, I think of, you know, Ben Horowitz is like culture is, you know, what you do, not what you say. Right. And proportionality is some of those older things. It seems like I can probably correlate like a specific action. But like what is governable? What is traceable? Like how do I trace? Aren't pre I know people are working on that, but um, how do you trace like the machine lear learning algorithm to a specific decision? Yeah. So I, I think. I think that's an absolutely fair question. Um, I, I'll start just by, you know, making a historical point, right? The Department of Defense is a pretty old institution. Um, we've been around a long time. AI is not the first technological revolution uh, that we've had to master. Um, and while not every part of the DOD's history, you know, is a flawless A+, um, in terms of mastering new technologies and doing so in a way that is, you know, responsible, um, we have some pretty good marks on our resume. So I would think, for example, of um, the nuclear Navy. Uh, not a lot of people know this, but the, the Navy actually has, you know, a lot of nuclear reactors in operation, powering submarines or powering aircraft carriers or powering other stuff. And you know, over the many decades of its history, the nuclear Navy has never had, you know, a reactor failure uh, that led to, you know, a, a loss of life or a significant release of radiation uh, into, into the environment. And that's at the same time around the world, right, what a lot of commercial nuclear power plants have. Um, the, the Navy actually has a spotless, you know, safety, regard, uh, safety report card. Um, in this incredibly complicated and difficult, and if you do it wrong, you know, dangerous technology. And the principles that we just described, right, the, the DOD's AI ethics principles, you know, with the exception of equitable, uh, but the others, responsible, traceable, reliable, governable, and the, the descriptions associated with that, you know, if you showed that to a reactor engineer in the Navy, they would be like, yep, that is exactly the culture that we live and breathe. Um, every single day. So, you know, we have to replicate 
that achievement and the other achievements like it, you know, the U.S. Um, orbital launch vehicles, the the rockets that, that that take satellites into space and other things, you know, the national security uh, sector uh, for both the U.S. military and the U.S. intelligence community has not had a launch failure since before the year 2000. I mean, they have the like the best safety record there a, a, as well. So when it comes to taking technologies that are really complicated, where the, the costs of failure are really high, uh, but getting it right, um, that's something the Department of Defense does better than just about any organization on planet Earth. But aren't there downsides when that's your standard, right? Um, you know, orbital launch like that. We, 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 we've just seen over the past 15 years how kind of having the like exquisite, always perfect all the time model, um, you know, may not actually get you where you want to be. And there's a chance that, um, you know, having a little more fast, playing a little more fast and loose when it comes to AI is actually going to end up leading to, um, you know, a more effective military and better outcomes from a DOD's perspective, as opposed to having, um, you know, crossing all your, uh, all, all, your, all your T's and dotting all your I's when in fact, um, that kind of leads to slower adoption and, um, uh, and, and limits, uh, like, you know, the eventual, uh, you know, ability of, of force production and what have you. Yeah. So I think that's a, per that's a terrific point. And the, the thing to note here is that the right answer is not no risk tolerance in all areas. The right answer is a calibrated risk tolerance an appropriately calibrated risk tolerance. Um, you know, when you're using machine learning to recommend what movie to watch next on Netflix, the stakes are pretty low. When you're using machine learning to, you know, this is not something we do, but hypothetically, um, if you're using machine learning to operate the reactor on a nuclear sub, the stakes are considerably higher, right? And I think what's good about the Department of Defense is that um, the existing safety policies that we have in place actually already are calibrated that types of way. There's certain types of standards that involve for, for systems that are, um, you know, not involved in the use of force or not involved in safety critical applications where if something goes wrong, a human life might be lost. And then there's different safety standards that apply for, for those other applications. And there's a whole sort of ladder uh, of, you know, what types of standards uh, other folks are different types of systems have to meet. Well, I want to pounce on that because like when I think about, you know, the 1940s, 50s, you had all these test pilots, Chuck Yeager taking incredible risks. We we're willing to lose, you know, pilots in that respect. Um, and you were talking about calibrating relative to the risk with the other side of the risk is obviously opportunity and and like payoff, right? Like when I get recommended a good movie, there's no payoff. There's a little pay payoff there. But like, you know, if you get into a war and autonomous technologies are decisive in a respect, then the other side of that risk is really like enormous, right? Uh, right so right. so how do you think about just like, are you willing to lose people? Like would the DOD yeah, so, ever be able to get there? Well, I mean, we, we ask, uh, you know, it's no longer we, cause I'm no longer in the DOD, but the DOD does ask the members of the US military to be willing to put their lives on the line. Um, and in certain job categories, there's people who, are putting their lives on the line, you know, every single day. Um, but, you know, you've kind of got me uh, talking in, in the position of the guy advocating for going slow, when in reality, my job was the guy who was advocating for us to go faster um, and was looking at what policies we could change, what procedures and processes and reforms we could make in order to go faster. I think the reason why AI actually makes that easier um, is because there's so many different areas in which uh, you can have certain types of capabilities that are uh, cheap and you can afford to lose them. Um, just, just pointing out, you know, uh, the difference between how the U.S. historically has used, you know, unmanned aerial systems and how they're playing out in, in Russia. Um, I think one important thing to note here is cost. Uh, the, the drones that were, you know, most widely known and were extremely popular in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were the Predator and Reaper drones, um, which, depending on what kind of sensors you put on the system, can cost something like $20 million per aircraft. The most expensive, you know, drones that the United States uh, makes, um, there's one that's cost more, more than $200 million. Those are incredibly expensive assets that you, like, absolutely really do not want to lose. 
But then if you look at the systems that are being incredibly decisive in the war in Ukraine, these are drones that cost thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, or the most advanced ones that are being used are like low single digit millions of dollars. And so the point is that calibrated risk posture that we can use, I think AI and other types of commercial technologies are really showing that in order to have something that's a really decisive military capability, you don't have to spend you know, $500 million. There's actually, so you can repurpose commercial technologies to put something together for a much cheaper price point, And that can allow you to op, you know, operate in a different risk posture. I had like a sci-fi question. I don't know if we'll, we'll get there. I guess like maybe, maybe just Greg to have you kind of meditate on, you know, there's, there's some corners of the internet, which sort of, which are convinced that AI is this like, you know, potentially industrial revolution level uh step change and uh i think there is there is baked into that a fear that like if china figures out ai faster or better than um uh the, the us does then the kind of balance of forces um could change very dramatically and very quickly in a way in which uh the the conversation we've had for the last 15 minutes could potentially lead the us to um to not uh or the defense department in particular to not kind of adapt to quickly, quickly enough to sort of reap the benefits. Um, any thoughts, reflections on that, um, on that narrative? And, and maybe that might lead us into a broader conversation on the sort of like bureaucratic agility that you uh, saw and, and witnessed over the past few years. My mental model for how is AI going to play out over the next decade and over the next decades after that, my sort of primary frame of reference is the adoption of computers. Um, so, you know, Alan Turing in World War II uh, and the team at Bletchley Park come up with this first sort of digital programmable computer. And uh, it's a really big deal in national security because it could break the German Enigma codes. That's what computers are doing in 1946. Right. But if you fast forward five decades, there's basically no part of military technology that is not taking advantage of computers at some point in the value chain, whether it's, um, you know, a system that has a computers running the aircraft autopilot or whether it's a, you know, explosive that was simulated and designed on a computer, even though it doesn't have any computers in it now. Um, I think there's that's a pretty helpful frame of reference and analogy uh, for artificial intelligence right now. Right this second, artificial intelligence has some really important military applications that the DOD is taking advantage of, um, including in intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, and other areas. But over the next few decades, I think we should expect AI to play an increasingly critical role in just about every area of military technology. Um, in terms of what the stakes of that are, Yes, I think there are plausible scenarios, right, in which the United States gets it wrong and loses, uh, you know, this competition, which, by which I mean, right, we lose our military technological edge. The U.S. technological edge, in terms of relative superiority, has eroded tremendously um, over the past few decades. That's not an opinion. That's basically a fact. And it's actually stated explicitly um, in, in the national defense strategy of the United States. Um, that's not, it's not a huge surprise, right? Back in 97, uh, the Chinese military budget was only twice that of Taiwan's military budget. You know, today, uh, the Chinese military budget has increased by, I can't remember if it was tenfold or twentyfold, but some incredible multiplier over that. And our budget has not increased tenfold. So it would kind of be surprising if we hadn't lost our military edge uh, in some way. Um, but the erosion has really sort of reached this tipping point where now like absolute superiority in military technology is at risk. Um, and the United States has always relied upon a qualitative edge in military technology, you know, at least since uh, the second half of the, the 20th century. And China's, as I said, China's commercial AI ecosystem in many ways is, is a global leader. Um, and China's military has undertaken a really incredible series of reforms 
you know, over the past 10, 15 years or so um, that have made them stronger and better in a lot of different ways. So if the Department of Defense fails to reform, it is totally possible that we would lose our, our military technology edge. And my organization, the, the Joint AI Center, um, was stood up, right, in, in part to be more agile, to move faster in accelerating the adoption of, of AI. And, you know, the DOD has even now announced, you know, more reforms in, in the same direction with the office of the chief digital and AI officer. You know, you were talking about, like, with the AI, we want to kind of get to, we're, we're starting with ISR, you know, predictive maintenance, this type of stuff. And you're saying, like, you know, the next couple of decades, you know, maybe we'll get to, to uh, you know, more autonomous lethality type things. Uh, but do we have that amount of time? Right. Like China is kind of moving fast. We have like all these systems like the next generation um, fighter will be 2030. The next generation unmanned or optionally unmanned vehicle 2030. The, act the Navy's new 30 year shipbuilding plan actually has fewer vertical launch systems, fewer ships um, through the 2020s. But it feels like the 2020s is going to be the dangerous decade potentially. Do, do we need to like accelerate those timelines? Is that just like too conservative? Because everything I see coming out of DOD is like 2030 and beyond will have, you know, maybe some of these potential systems, maybe, right? Optionally unmanned, but not really, you know, autonomous or unmanned. No, I, I think you're totally right. And I would say that part of the, the, the trap that the Department of Defense has fallen into from its technology paradigm perspective is that there's been an overemphasis on what you might call expensive, exquisite systems. So these are, you know, like the aircraft carriers, which cost tens of billions of dollars per ship, or um, the most advanced, you know, aircraft, which cost uh, maybe like $500 million per aircraft. You know, there are aircraft that cost that much. Um, and what's great about these systems is that they have, you know, phenomenal performance uh, in, across the ton of different metrics. But when your system is that large, that expensive, that complicated, it really frustrates your pace of innovation because you can't afford to play fast and loose with systems that cost $10 billion. And that's why what I'm hoping will occur uh, and what I'm rooting for is for the Department of Defense to sort of learn from what's going on in Ukraine, where the drones that are having the biggest impact are cheap um, and in many cases, right, are lightly repurposed commercial off the shelf uh, types of technologies. You can go through, um, you know, many dozens of cycles of iteration uh, that doesn't have to take, you know, 10 years between one aircraft generation to the next. But you can only do that if these things are cheap and you can afford, right, to, to take a lot of risks as you're developing them. Um, and I think AI and especially what's coming out of the commercial AI sector and the commercial autonomy sector offers a path towards that new and improved pace of innovation. And it is certainly the case uh, that, that China will jump on that new innovation track um, if the United States fails to. Yeah, well, I guess that's that's nice to say, but what what about the 2020s, right? Um, like, no, that is that is a story of the 2020. Yeah, it should be, but is, is the department moving in that direction, right? It seems like by the we already have our our five year plan, so 2027 might be the first time, right? Like we can start injecting these. Um, I guess I guess that's one of the issues, right? Like I see these pictures where China had 30 different UAVs. Um, lined up, right? And they have all sorts of experimentation. How did China get the diversity in experimentation and iteration? Um, kind of, it seems like they're doing that, right? At least Department of Defense people say they're doing that, but the Department of Defense can't do it. And that's like, that should be the, the home turf of the United States. Yeah, I mean, there's parts of the, the Department of Defense that are, you know, deeply innovative and, and make it a ton of progress. But I share your exact same complaint and frustration, and I lived that uh, when I was at the Department of Defense. It is, you know, a fact uh, that we're not moving fast enough. And I say that as a guy who just left an organization whose job was to make us move faster. Yeah. Um, 
there is some favorable developments, uh, you know, in this area, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, say that they're enough. Um, you know, one of the things that has really been a, an important game changer in the commercial sector is putting in place like really strong development environments and development platforms that sort of lower the costs of experimentation uh, and playing around with, especially machine learning and AI, but really just with software and digitally enabled capabilities in general. Um, that's harder to do in the Department of Defense because of cybersecurity requirements, because of bureaucratic requirements, because of you know what has to happen when you're handling classified data sources. Um, but those that flavor of problems uh, is the type of things that you know this, this new organization, the the Office of the Chief Digital and AI Officer, those are exactly the sorts of challenges that they're trying to to to, to replicate or to address to sort of lower the cost of experimentation across the entire Department of Defense. So two, two anecdotes and then come back to the question. So George Packer had a fantastic long form piece about uh, the effort of the State Department to get lots and lots of people out of Afghanistan um, in the final uh, months and weeks of the, um, uh, of the US presence there. And there was this quote by uh, Representative Malinowski who basically said, you know, that there were a beautiful shining three weeks where the rules didn't apply and we were able to process, you know, like 1000 X more people than we would have in a normal week because folks just stopped caring because they saw the Taliban coming and they knew they had to not worry about um, all the regulations and a sort of similar story, not quite all the way there, but somewhat analogous. I heard on Eric's uh, podcast acquisition talk where he uh, published this, you know, long discussion between all these folks who were talking about what it took to make an MRAP. My question to you, Greg, is like, if, you know, tomorrow there was that wartime, um, you know, exigency, is that the right word? Um, if, If there was that sort of wartime exigency where like everyone had to start doing this stuff now, um, do you think the sort of bureaucratic red tape is in itself the hurdle or are there or to what extent is it just that versus the kind of like institutional capabilities that would allow a, a sort of you know organization or network of organizations connected to the DOD to exploit the opportunities that, um, you know, in you know, now and then in the next few years are going to be presented by all of this new technology and um, AI in particular? So I think. Bureaucratic red tape is a really painful and very real part of the story. Um, and your you know, analogy for the, the, the State Department in Afghanistan rings really true to me. One of the things that I find really frustrating in terms of people who are trying to reform policies in the Department of Defense um, is that there's often, uh, you know, say, oh, we'll create a new authority or we'll create a policy waiver process, you know, for people who want to go around X, Y, Z, uh, you know, really painful and long, you know, um, uh, really painful and time intensive policy or process. Uh, and I think the proliferation of waivers and uh, you new and distinct authorities is like, its own proliferation of additional bureaucratic complexity. You know, what you really want is for it to be simple, easy, and quick for people to do good work. That's what I want. And I'm in favor of the folks who are trying to, you know, to fight for that sort of thing. Um, Just to be real, though, the sort of other side of that equation is the more traditional uh, problem that every military on Earth has to solve. I mean, the first problem that the U.S. government, you know, had to solve uh, back in like, you know, 1789 is how do you make sure the people who have the guns listen to the people who got the votes, right? That's a really thorny problem. Plenty of countries around the world fail to solve that problem. Um, and so there's plenty of structures that have been in place for decades or hundreds of years, right, in the United States Department of Defense and the military, which are designed to ensure that Congress is really in charge of the DOD budget, that the president of the United States is the commander in chief of these forces. And um, so many of those, you know, structures that have become in place have 
become ossified, sclerotic, and really problematic in terms of just allowing good people to do good work. Um, but there, there is a problem that they were created to solve. And as we try and, you know, adopt new structures that are more optimized for flexibility and agility, um, we at least have to, to pay attention uh, to what it is that we're, we're trying to reform. Yeah, no, what I wanted to kind of throw back at you was on the first point there where we have like the waivers and proliferation, we just need to kind of like speed that up and delegate decisions um, to individuals. No, no, no. My, my, my complaint there, sorry to interrupt. My complaint there is that like people think they're solving the problem when they create a waiver, which usually in its best form, right, means they solve the problem for them, for like their little pet project. But like the real problem is why is this a process that is so bad that you need a waiver, right? And then you have these bureaucrats who are like, what am I? What is my role in life? I'm the person who understands how to go through this waiver process. Um, and that's just the wrong way, you know, to, to run a government. Um, there's, there's a lot of sort of thoughts about, okay, it would take a million years in order for us to fix this policy. So I'll shoot short of that and I'll try and create a waiver. But then you have people whose primary skill set and their primary job function um, is, is to navigate these waiver processes. And it makes it really hard for people who are coming into the Department of Defense to be effective right out of the gate. Uh, one of the things the Department of Defense has stated over and over again, you know, that they want to do is attract, uh, you know, more of the talent pool that is working in the commercial talent uh, technology sector to come and work for the Department of Defense. But if those folks come to the Department of Defense and then their primary, you know, experience of life is... Uh, being confused by the bureaucratic uh, morass, well, they're not going to accomplish a lot, you know, in the years that they are willing to to serve their country. Yeah, so good good point. Uh, but I wanted to kind of bring that back to because I was also listening to Jordan's podcast on the the Fat Leonard scandal, right? So all these things are kind of like reactions to Fat Leonard scandal type things. Is do you see like that kind of corruption as like endemic, and we need some of these structures or you know, should we just kind of get rid of those? Because I think there's been a number of times people have come in from the outside, right? Nick Shaylon, Nand over at um, the Jake, Preston Dunlap, and they're all kind of like leaving, right? I just, so um, they're, I guess they're leaving because of the bureaucratic red tape and they can't get it done. But then there's the other side that says, is like pointing at Fat Leonard and saying, we can't give these types of people, you know, authority. Yeah, so- this is this is a fabulous point, and I think you can almost think about it like a math equation. Um, if you're trying to optimize for the overall productivity of the system, corruption is something that will sap, you know, uh, away from productivity. Dollars going into Fat Leonard's pockets are dollars that are not, you know, being used to buy fuel for ships uh, in, in the Navy. Um, but on the other side, enforcement has its own cost, right? Uh, if you're going to enforce anti-corruption rules, there's uh, all the things that were a good idea that we said no to because uh, they they couldn't get around, um, you know, some uh, safeguard that is meant to reduce the risk of some corrupt thing happening. And then there's also just like the time and attention and dollars spent navigating those processes, even for the ones that get through. Um, and I think when any time there is a scandal there is, you know, an immediate uh, thought of, you know, okay, how do we make sure this never happens again? And um, a lot of the ways that that takes place is by coming up with processes that are really draconian and, and onerous uh, and make it really hard to get anything done, you know, even if they also make it hard to get corrupt things done. And so I'm, I'm in favor of, of like reassessing those types of policies, not because, you know, I want more corruption, but because I want less onerous enforcement and preventative measures. I want to add one thing here, which is, you know, there is there are, the, the United States military enjoys perhaps the highest approval ratings of any institution in American society. It's something like 80 percent public approval ratings. You'll find no tech company. You'll find no individual you know, who, who enjoys the support uh, that the United States military does. And part of it is because they take it really, really, really seriously when they get things wrong. 
um, and they work really, really hard uh, to, to ensure that they deserve the trust of the American people. But I also think it is the case, right, that what the American people want is performance and they want national security and they want credible, effective deterrence. Um, and with the existing processes that we have in place, we're not going to be able to deliver all those things. Greg Allen, thanks so much for being a part of China Talk. Oh, oh I had a bad joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Greg, clearly uh, by slumming it with us at the uh, at China Acquisition Talk, you didn't quite play the fat Leonard game as well as you could have. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe you're maybe you're just bitter uh, and wanted um uh, wanted another bite at the apple once uh, once people listen to this podcast and, and loosen the rules up. Yeah, if there if I was uh, trying to optimize for you know generous payouts and payoffs, I clearly misplayed my hand. Greg Allen, thanks so much for being part of China Talk. Hey, uh, you know, long time listener, first time caller. Great to be with you guys.